Thank you, Philosopher Cat, for... Oh, see, now you've, you've tripped me up and I even said it wrong. <laughs> Philosopher Cat, uh, happy lamster. Happy lamster to you, and I'm sorry <laughs> about that. I jinxed you. You did jinx me right before we, we went live. Um, yes, so we're going to be talking about resurrection, which I'm excited about because I've talked about this subject, of course, for probably thousands of hours with Christians, but I'm hoping to get a bit more of an esoteric perspective from you and uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe throw, throw some new ideas in, into the mix. All right, yeah. Well, I I guess we should kind of preface it a little bit. Um, you know, the concept of resurrection is is sort of a fundamental part of what we could loosely call these dying God cults. And this idea that a God dies and is then reborn or resurrected and goes on to this higher plane of existence. And there's quite a number of dying God cults from antiquity, Christianity among them. Um, in addition to Jesus, other dying gods would include uh, the Egyptian Osiris, um, possibly the Persian Mithras, the Babylonian Tammuz, Norse Odin, quite a number of others. Um, it was very, very prevalent um, among what we could say are like Hyperborean or Atlantean descended cultures. Um, now, like a, a lot of Christians don't like this because when they think that their religion is the only one true religion, I think they kind of often feel threatened by the idea that their most important stories already existed long before Jesus appeared. And I think they kind of dislike this insinuation that they stole something from the pagans, right? Or that these spiritual teachings could exist independent of a dogmatic religious framework. But um, in my view, the fact that this story appears over and over again in so many different eras and places and cultural contexts actually, I think, lends more credibility to the story, not less. Like the story is more likely to contain an important metaphysical truth because God made sure that people all over the world and all across time could have access to this story in a way that made sense to them or through a messenger that was part of their culture. And um, like, you know, because God is not bound by any religious dogma. And I think God does find a way to speak to people who are listening, no matter what their beliefs are. Um, the idea that God didn't give anyone a pathway to heaven until Jesus came along is, I, I, I mean, a little bit myopic and arrogant, if I'm being honest. And, you know, furthermore, I think this sort of limited thinking kind of prevents us from deeply understanding the symbolism behind the stories of resurrection. And dogma can really prevent us from getting at the fundamental essence of the message. So the form the story takes is not the important thing here, especially when we're looking esoterically, uh, because the metaphysical truths they're trying to communicate, um, you know, those those truths stand as truths outside of any human trappings that we place over it in order for us to understand it, if that makes sense. So is the concept that a god could die uh, unusual? Is it is it a break from... Because, of course, humans die very frequently, almost all of them. And then gods tend to, I think, mythologically live just forever it's the same the same god that was around for my father and my father's father uh, so when there's a story of a dying god is is that significant and if so what's the what's the significance of it um there's a lot of significance to it and um you gave me kind of like a set of bullet points to cover that you wanted to talk about. And actually almost every single one of them hits on kind of like a different significant point of this. Great. And the, you know, the most fundamental one is, is this idea of sacrifice. So, hmm. um, you know, first you need to understand that the story of the resurrection is a mystery in, in the religious and spiritual sense, which is to say um, it's an allegorical understanding of a story that contains crucial information about man's means to access the transcendent. And allegorical stories have multiple layers of meaning. It's trying to give us a template through which we can understand these metaphysical principles of the universe in a way that makes sense to our human minds. It's, um, it's trying to communicate something of, of a divine nature to us that words alone just can't express. And so it relies really heavily on symbolic language to do this. 
And these stories of dying and rising gods are connected to an entire class of sacrificial rites, many of which were connected to kingship, and they're intended to produce a heroic immortality in the initiate. Um, the essence of these sacrificial rites is the idea of going beyond oneself, fulfilling one's potential, and manifesting one's own being. And when we talk about being and becoming in the context of this talk, everybody should know we're talking about being and becoming with their capital letters, like in kind of a Heideggerian sense. Do you, do you just want to uh, explain what being and becoming mean in a, in a sentence or two in that Heideggerian sense? Yeah, maybe we should. So um, being is kind of is a state of eternality, unchangeability. It's associated with the divine, with spirit, with God. Uh, becoming is the state of materiality, of change, of flux, the wheel of fate and fortune. It's associated with the moon. Um, and we are in a state of becoming. As human beings, we're in a state of becoming, but God is always in a state of being. And the whole point of a spiritual path is to get you out of becoming and into being. Um, and so this is what these sacrificial rites are kind of intended to do, that it it is through this process of suffering, of sacrificing uh, and going beyond yourself that this is achieved. And you know, the Vedas speak of how the entire universe was manifested in this way when um, Brahman, which is the Hindu godhead, uh, created this higher and more perfect form of itself. And it's from that act that all heavenly archetypes of divine and triumphal regality were manifested. And when Brahman manifested creation, he did so by creating a higher, more perfect form of himself. Perfection comes from the complete manifestation of potential because if anything's left unmanifest, then your potential's not fulfilled, that the perfection is not achieved. So this idea, well, you could have become more, but you failed to do so, right? The idea is, mm. well, bringing the purpose of this, this sacrificial rites is to bring all that potential up to the forefront and actualize it. Mm. Is there a contradiction between the idea of death, which surely lives in the world of becoming, and then the idea of a god, which is uh, definitionally a, a, a being of being. So a god dying seems like a, a crossing of uh, categories. Yeah, well, in, in most of these stories, the, um, the god was kind of like embodied. They had to uh -huh. kind of come to earth, you know, become in the flesh because they have to enter the world of becoming in order to do that. Well, why do they do that? They're, they're coming to teach us how to do it. They're establishing the rights. And these mm. sacrificial rights then reenact that God's uh, story of death and rebirth. Mm. So let's talk about then that idea of an, an embodied deity, because I, I've often wondered how this has been viewed by different cultures throughout history, that you have these mythical stories involving gods and demigods and humans and their interactions so how often is uh, are the gods living in a a realm uh, that is ethereal and, and then once the gods come down and take on a human form um do, do they typically lose all of their godlike powers and and become limited to to the domain of man or are, are, are they halfway between do they yeah so what, what what's the what's the common way to think about a god being contained in the form of a, of a man um that's a little bit of a tough one because different religious traditions are going to approach that differently i mean when you look at jesus for example um who was you know more than likely an actual historical figure well, we have a bit of a difficulty there because we have Jesus, the man, the historical figure, but then we have this kind of apotheosized form of him that's been mytholo mythologized and, um, you know, maybe some of the historical parts of the figure of Jesus are kind of getting lost in the mythologizing. Um, was Jesus a god or was he a man who became like a god who who achieved divinity, you know? and we can't really know that. I mean, I, I know Christians kind of like they have their own sets of beliefs that, oh, yes, he was definitely God in the flesh. But, um, you know, 
from a purely historical perspective, it seems very likely to me that he spent his missing years um, traveling around um, what was kind of like ancient civilization at that time through Mesopotamia, the Mediterranean, um, most likely visiting many mystery schools, learning their esoteric secrets. Um, it seems likely that he even spent some time in India learning from the Rishis. And then when he comes back and he starts teaching and preaching, he's teaching a message of Dharma and he's performing what are called uh, cities, miracles. The miracles he performs are exactly the types of cities that um, enlightened rishis perform. And the message he's teaching is like, it's so at odds with um, the rabbinical Jews. And they didn't like that, so they killed him for it, right? <laughs> uh, and it's like, well, was this God just wandering around earth in a man's body or was this a man who became like a god through the process of in various initiations and, and intense spiritual practice and ascesis um you know his intense fasting and stuff that's all like a uh, very monk-like behavior but then on the other hand we could look at a god um like uh, like krishna in the bhagavad gita who is um, he's very much present in the story as just he's god but he's just there hanging out with us mere mortals and there's not, um, you know, there's there's not like this question of like, well, was he or wasn't he like a real historical figure? So I, I think that when you're thinking about whether or not like the, is the God embodied, or do they have their powers and stuff? It's like it's almost even the wrong question to ask. Yeah, I, I was just curious because uh, uh, like it, it it always made me wonder. Say you you hear about the ancient greek or roman myths of the gods um fighting and whatever they got up to you know having parties and you wonder did did your everyday person on the street hearing these stories picture these gods as as living somewhere spatially different or or even existing or, or was it a much more um typological mythic did the you know the we, we with in the case of jesus as you point out it's associated with literalism in the sense of, of an, a, a historical person um so i wonder whether that makes christianity unusually interested in the question of of kind of literalism versus other other societies which maybe ha have a more allegorical uh, interest. I think it is a particular problem for Christianity. And part of that is because they have had to, you know, Christendom has really had to compete with scientism. It's, uh, it's a modern religion competing with another modern religion, essentially. And in an attempt, I think, to validate itself, it has tried to come up with empirical proof and it has become overly focused on this idea. No, Jesus was a real person. The, Bi the events in the Bible are literally true. And as the church kind of crushed the esoteric sects of Christianity, there's nothing left to push back against that. All the symbolism is lost. And so Christians don't even themselves, they have nothing to grasp that but the, their own like historicity of the stories. And it's almost like it feels like to me when I speak to Christians that they feel like if there was definitive proof that these stories never happened, their faith would almost crumble. And it's because they they can't understand the stories allegorically, they've lost the symbolic language, um, which is really a shame because, you know, even though I'm not a Christian myself and it's not a path I would personally choose, there are many people who choose that path. It, it has the potential to be a very fulfilling path for for people, but you know, you'll struggle to find any kind of real spiritual enlightenment if you can't get below the surface level of these stories. So, you know, hopefully that's something we can kind of clear up at least with this story today. Yeah, I, I, I guess one of the reasons that Christians um, are of the opinion that the the literal um, historicity of the stories in the Bible are true is because there's verses in the New Testament that say, you know, if if Jesus didn't literally rise, well, it doesn't have the word literally, but um, if if he he didn't rise from the dead, then our, our uh, faith is useless and we are, we are to be most pitied amongst 
all all people. So so there was I think a very early Christian view that the actual resurrection was important. So so perhaps uh, it perhaps the ideas of Christianity could be rescued into a form of um, a, a broad broader um, cross religious um, symbolism. But certainly, I would say the evidence is for the very early Christians who started the faith that that's not how they were thinking about it at the time. Early Christianity was very disorganized, but it, yeah, I mean, that that, that could be the case. I mean, um, sorry, you actually had a central question there, and I it just completely went out of my head. <laughs> so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, I'm well, probably I, only I, like 65, 70% today. Yes, you're, yes you, you, you've been slightly under the weather today, and I'm very grateful you agreed to go ahead anyway, so that's great. Um, yeah, so I was saying... Um, it might be that that Christianity, as uh, uh, one embodiment of a pattern of religious belief that you can see across multiple cultures, um, could, it, it could be included in that group and followed as a general um, form of esotericism. But uh, my point was that the the originators of the faith, like the people writing the documents that became the canonical letters that formed the Bible. Um, and uh, yes, you're right. There was very diverse views if you go forwards a hundred years. But um, the, the the scriptures that Christians treat as um, as holy include some fairly straightforward. Um, well, so, some some fairly straightforward statements that say that the the the, the actual death and resurrection is critical to the the beliefs of the group um right yeah so you'd you'd have to say that the the stories of christ were um already being um twisted or the the, the teachings of christ were already being twisted right within... well this goes this goes back to what i said earlier they're too focused on it being literally true it doesn't matter if it was literally true. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But what matters is that it's spiritually true and that it's providing a spiritual template for you to follow. It's telling you a spiritual truth about what you personally need to do in order to become like Christ. So let me give um, a non-Christian example here. Sure. Um, in uh, one of my revolt episodes, maybe it was like episode six or something, um, I gave... An example of Odin and yeah it would be episode six because that's one in which we talk a lot about these sacrificial rites. Um, Odin hung himself from Yggdrasil the world tree um, which is an axial symbol uh, much like a cross. Uh, he pierced himself with a spear he forbade anyone to offer him any assistance and then he just kind of like teetered on the brink of life and death for nine days until finally the runes accepted his sacrifice and revealed their secrets to him. And what's really interesting is what he says um, in the Havamal, Odin says, Wounded, I hung on a windswept gallows for nine long nights, pierced by a spear, pledged to Odin, offered myself to myself. And the reason I love this example is because of that line, offered myself to myself. What does this mean? He sacrificed himself to himself? It means he's going beyond himself. And that means that he's sacrificing his lower nature to achieve something higher. And when you make that ultimate sacrifice of detaching yourself fully from materiality, including your attachment to your own body and physical life, then your reward is going to be divine wisdom and not death. And this is the same message of Jesus on the cross. So a lot of Christians, you know, they, they might beg to differ and say, no, no, Jesus sacrificed himself to just save all of us, not to obtain divine knowledge. But this is divine knowledge that he's giving us. And he did obtain resurrection. And that's, you know, we can explore that in, in a bit. But when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is what he meant. This is the path he laid out. Sacrifice yourself and your worldly desires and your attachments for the sake of transcendence. And only in so doing can you achieve unity with God in heaven. You can't make it to heaven if you're too attached to what this world has to offer. 
it's not enough to say, oh, well, Jesus made that sacrifice, so I'm off the hook. I don't have to do anything to achieve transcendence. Um, I can just indulge in the pleasures of this life because Jesus saved me. That's really lazy and irresponsible and, um, you know, frankly, quite ignoble, uh, very, very plebeian, <laughs> if I'm good to, not to put too fine a point on it. But I don't think Jesus came and made that sacrifice so that we could all live in hedonism and nescience, but to show us what we need to do. And he essentially took a mystery school teaching and made it public knowledge. And if you want to follow Jesus, you need to become like Jesus. And that means producing an ontological change within yourself to actually become Christ-like. Yeah, I, I, I don't think um, the concept that you can be saved by Christ and therefore no longer need to live your life in a Christ-like way is an accurate reflection of Christian teaching. Um, but certainly that is how some people appear to take it, you know, oh, well, you know, Christ's dealt with it, so I can just go off and uh, live my lazy, short-term, um, you know, pleasure-filled existence. And actually, I think, I, I, I think a place where I, I would agree with you is that that actually is not going to be effective right Christ calls us to to follow him I mean what's the what is it um take up your cross and follow me so there is there is definitely a call to 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 reflect in your life the the way that Christ lived I mean I, well, I think of a do I mean, dozen of those symbolic in itself. Ideas. take up your cross well what is the symbolism of the cross many many layered um, entire books have been written on this, but in its, in its most simplest distilled essence, the cross is an axial symbol. What, what is an axial symbol? It's something polar. It's something that's emblematic of the center of the wheel, the unmoved mover. It is being. That means you need to pick up your sense of being. You need to embody the, the solar kingly element within yourself. Jesus was called a king. He's a sacred king. Um, if you're going to pick up your cross, it doesn't mean you just accept your sufferings in life. That's part of it. You, you could definitely put that interpretation on it. And, um, you know, many of Jesus's teachings would certainly fall in line with this idea of, you know, equanimity with the sufferings life deals out to us, because that's part of being detached from materiality. And saying, okay, well, I, I understand that this world is an illusion. It's, it's a powerful and painful illusion. It's very intense. Um, but there's uh, the quality of being able to step back, to zoom out and say, this is only a tiny little part of the big picture. And it's, you know, compared to what is spiritually real, this is not. And, you know, even, uh, even Jesus was subject to this. Whether you want to think he was a man who became a god or a god who became a man, he walked on this earth, he had to endure um, his, his crucifixion and everything that went along with that. You know, and he, he, he prayed himself. He said, you know, let this cup pass from me. He still, despite his spiritual enlightenment, you know, still was subject to the same illusion that we are. And the same pains and sufferings that come with it. But he was still willing to go through it because he knew what it was for. Now, we struggle with that because we don't have that divine foresight. And we can be like, why do I have to suffer through this? What is the point? Um, but the point is, in many cases, suffering is designed to actually break your attachment to materiality. If materiality is that unpleasant, what else have you got to turn to but God? Hmm. It makes me think of um, this verse from Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, uh, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So Jesus is like the, the, the sort of hypothetical best version of us where um, w we have weakness and fall to it, but he has the same weakness as us and it's significant that he is in our like he and it sounds like it's similar in some of these other cases you're talking about right that um that there's a there's an association between our form and the form of the 
perfect one who then like performs the role that we are also called to do yeah to me this even lends a little bit of weight to the idea that jesus was a man who became a god because he's you know, no matter how enlightened he is, you know, he's still struggling with the temptations of this world uh, and the cravings and aversions that it produces. Um, and that doesn't mean he wasn't born special, you know, much in the way you could say, well, the Buddha was born special. You'd have to be born really special in order to achieve that kind of enlightenment in a lifetime, let alone by the time you're 30, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so obviously, like, regardless of who he was, he was obviously like, special from the time he came out of the womb but um you know it's uh yeah i mean it's it's interesting to think about these things and i i you know i hope nobody in the chat's offended by this because i know some christians have some strong feelings on these things but um i'm just kind of trying to put a bit of more of a esoteric spin on it I don't, I don't think you should worry about whether you're offending people. I think it's more useful for everybody, to be honest. <laughs> I, don't right? want, I don't want to offend Christians on their high holy day. Come on, I'm not that mean. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Um, that's, that, that, that's very thoughtful. But, but uh, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want you to feel like you have to um, walk on eggshells, <laughs> which, which oh, I, no, hopefully never. you don't. <laughs> no, I never feel like I have to walk on eggshells. Good. Um, but... Uh, yeah, like to um, to kind of get back to like just Jesus's story and stuff, you know, um, one interesting detail of his story is that he was entombed in a cave. And caves have long been used for both initiatic and funerary purposes. And there is a connection between these two things because death and birth are two faces of one same change of state. And the passage between the two takes place in darkness, initiation, of course, being called the second birth. And uh, interestingly, you know, though the outside world of the cave is illumined by physical light and the interior of the cave is literally dark, um, from, a meta from a metaphysical perspective, the interior of such a cave that Jesus was in or any initiate is in is illumined within uh, with the light of transcendence. And then it's the outside world that's really in darkness. And it's from this cave that Jesus has his descent into the underworld, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I understand that this is a topic of a little bit of debate within Christianity as to, like, which underworld he went to and why he went there. Right? I don't know what your take is on that, but... Um... Yeah, so there's, there's a... a, a and I, I, I don't know all the ins and outs. So there's, a, as I understand it, a Catholic tradition... Um, which says that he, um, you might remember AA made quite a fun video on this where he called it the the ultimate D and D quest of all time. <laughs> it was um, the harrowing of hell, where he go goes on this epic quest to preach to all the damned um, before rising again. Um, I, I think that the I, I prefer not to speculate, and I don't put as much weight on tradition. So uh, I I don't have I don't have enormously strong views about about that question. I, th I think there's probably still some some mystery okay. in exactly what was going on at that time. Yeah, and and I know there's been a lot of different translations, and sometimes it's translated as the underworld or Hades or Sheol, or sometimes yeah. it's translated as hell. Um, the, these words exist in the Old and the New Testament in in various places, and and they're um, not in fact in, in no in, in in many ways the fact that we read everything through a like a lot of our understanding of theology can be influenced by the King James Bible in particular, which translates all these words as being the same thing. I think Sheol was referring to a. A, like a essentially a big fire where the outside Jerusalem they just throw all their garbage on. So um, like, no, no, that's that's the, the Hebrew Hades underworld, maybe. and basically, uh, 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 oh, Sheol yes, is yes. where uh, in in the Jewish faith um, they don't. Uh, let me look. It they, up. Yeah, it might be Gehenna that you're thinking of, but Sheol is where uh, souls all souls go there after they die. It doesn't matter how virtuously you live. So right. They don't. Re Jews do not really believe in an afterlife concept in the way Christians do. They don't believe in like a heaven. You just everyone goes to sh goes to Sheol, and 
over time, you eventually just fade away into nothingness. Now, however great your deeds were in life, you'll exist as a shade for a little bit longer than people who did nothing with their lives. But eventually you all just go into the same dissolution. It's really kind of depressing. And it explains maybe a lot about their faith and why it is the, the way it is. But um, I would say my perspective is that the, the best interpretation of this is that Jesus went to the underworld, not necessarily to hell, which is something very specific to the Christian faith that I think even came a little bit later in the tradition. But, you know, the question, of course, everybody asks is, why would the Son of God have to go to the underworld, whether you consider that hell or not? And this is really important from a mystery and initiatic perspective, because you have to do this in order to make the divine leap and uh, the Olympian leap into the divine realms. So traditionally speaking, uh, you had to first cross the river of the underworld. And this is, this isn't strictly a Christian interpretation, obviously, but I think Christians can gain a deeper understanding of their own faith if they're open to the idea that Christianity doesn't have a monopoly on these types of stories and that a wider understanding can kind of help fill in some of the gaps and symbolism that have been lost to Christendom over time. So this is the story of many dying gods who also first had to pass through the underworld before they were resurrected. Um, I talk about this extensively in episode nine of my revolt series, The Two Paths in the Afterlife, this idea that one has to have a really solid sense of spiritual being that can withstand the dissolution of death and then remain conscious enough to make that crossing. Um, this is essential if you're going to experience the second birth. Otherwise, you experience what's called the second death, being sucked into the underworld into total dissolution for all eternity. And obviously, Jesus, having sacrificed himself in the manner that he did, was prepared to make such a crossing. Um, in many traditions, there's this idea of a resurrection body, and it's basically what you achieve when you undergo that ontological change in being that's produced by initiation uh, or through sacrifice. And this resurrection body is like a boat that allows you to cross the river of the underworld and then be lifted up into the celestial realms or heaven or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's what qualifies you to reunite with the divine. And so you have to... I, it's, it's not even like, it's not a boat and a river, literally, but the idea is that um, through developing a higher spirit, that when death hits, you are not overcome by the sensation of death. Because when you die, the soul dis discards everything it doesn't need anymore. And that includes everything from this life. It's your memories, your body, your personality, that's all discarded because it's not part of your soul. Like if you ask yourself, who am I if I'm not your name? Who am I if I'm not a parent? Who am I if I'm not whatever job you do? Who am I if I'm not somebody um, who likes to drink beer and watch footy on the weekends? You know, take away all the things that make up you in life and most people have nothing left under that. They will not cross the river. You have to have a sense of inner being, and that is what allows you to cross the river of the underworld that would otherwise suck you down. Whether you want to believe that sucks you down into hell or to Sheol or whatever, the fact is, if you cannot cross that river, there's nothing left of you to reunite with God. Now, this is a kind of an anti-Christian idea in some ways because Christians have this very unique and recent idea that everyone has an immortal soul. And this is not the opinion of pretty much any other religion that came before. The idea was you have an animating spirit, you and maybe a little divine spark, you have the potential to develop a soul or a spirit, a higher spirit, but most people don't do this because it's not enough to just like go to church on Sunday and then do whatever you want the rest of the week. If you're not actually living like Christ and actually doing something to produce that ontological change, to be internally Christ-like, to be God-like, you are not going to cross the river. You will not make it to heaven because there's not anything there to carry your consciousness. Um, so when, you know, this is obviously a really important thing when it comes to talking about resurrection, right? Um, 
because this resurrection is not some kind of a zombie thing where the dead are raised up out of their graves. It's the lifting up of the spiritual nature within man into life and light. And it's the Christ in man that must be raised up. And so the resurrection is an internal and eternal mystery. And it's a regeneration and a release of the spiritual entity from this material sepulcher of the body, the instincts and the appetites. And so Jesus' crucifixion stories is... Um, in many ways, really similar to what's been reenacted by so many mystery cults in ancient times, because uh, their goal was to create a soul that could withstand death, to create this resurrection body. And so these sacrificial and initiatic rituals would, uh, as I said before, they reenact the story of the dying God. And it's very important to remember that ritual is symbol in action. That's probably the simplest way to think about what rituals are. It's symbol in action. And symbols are things that convey layered and deep metaphysical truths. And I mean, technically the celebration of the Eucharist is loosely a ritual reenactment of the death and rebirth of, of Jesus. And I mean, if it were done by qualified priests, uh, it might actually have some effectiveness in producing the necessary ontological change in the, in the people who partake of it. But um, I think in modern times now, that's probably not likely to happen for a number of reasons. That's interesting. I, could you, do, you, do you mind going into that? What 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 is it about um, mo the modern priests that you think would m make it unlikely for that uh, ritual to to be effective? Because they have not initiated, they have not sacrificed themselves to themselves, and they are not Christ-like in nature. So the priests have to first undergo well, that tra that self transformation. Yes, because be if because if you haven't um, undergone that ontological change in being, you don't have a connection with the divine. You have to have this, you have to have undergone this ontological change of state that puts you in perpetual contact with the divine. It changes you. You start to grow divinity within yourself. And it's not like, it's not like a phone call that you could you just hang up when you're done or you call up when you're ready to do the ritual. It's always there within you. And mm. I mean, I, I was raised Catholic. I've met many priests over the years. I have never met a single priest or monk or nun or bishop who embodied Christ because you can tell they have a spiritual gravitas about them. If they embodied Christ, you would almost feel like you were standing in the presence of something divine when you're around them. Can anyone honestly say that about their parish priest? Of course not, because none of them, they live modern lives. They, ha they are not living the lives of ascetic monks. They, they go to seminary at universities and they, they live out in the public. They're not, um, and you go to these churches and they're like trying to be cool and they're bringing all this degeneracy into church all the time. Um, I think the Orthodox have maybe spared themselves a little bit from that. And some of the churches that still practice the Latin mass, but the fact is that they have not sacrificed their material natures to their spiritual nature. And so there's this formalistic quality to the ritual and they, there may be a strong pathos surrounding this ritual. Like there might be a lot of sentimentality and feelings, which is what you find in a lot of these like, um, like crazy fundamentalist churches where they're starting to like work people up into like this frenzy. And it's, uh, it's this very, that's a very downward transcending thing. It's, it's actually very chthonic and anti-spiritual uh, when they do that. But in a Catholic church where they're celebrating Eucharist, it's just a formality. It's these priests are not qualified to be doing what they're doing and they don't, they cannot channel the supernatural essence because they don't have the inner quality to do that. They are not able to function as a conduit. It's like taking a piece of plastic and using it as a wire and being like, why won't this conduct electricity? Well, it's not a wire. It's not metal. <laughs> could, could you talk a little bit about the connection between um being divinity and spirituality um 
I mean, they're all linked. What can you clarify? What? Uh, yeah. What so, you, 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 is um, is the personal regeneration that produces being equivalent to, in some way, joining to the divine? And is that equivalent to spirituality, uh, or, or are there subtle differences in these categories? Well, that that is the goal of spirituality. To, to answer it in the most simple sense. Um, to come the, towards God. To come towards God, to come towards being. Um, and as you, as I mean, we can't ever really leave becoming behind when we're here on earth. The idea is that we do the work here on earth that when we die, we are able to make that final leap. Um, and the more you develop here on earth, obviously, the better chance you have. Who knows what is actually necessary, right? We don't know what level of work you actually need to achieve that because nobody comes back and tells us. All you can do is do the best you can. Um, but uh, argu arguably, that was the significance of Jesus, that he did yeah. come back and told us. Well, he doesn't tell us exactly, he, he doesn't say specifically, this is how much work you need to do. But if you read between the lines and you look at it symbolically and esoterically, um, you know, you get a better understanding of it, but you're still not like, okay, well, how Christ-like do I actually have to be? How much is even really possible for people like us? Is it like, do we get a little bit of wiggle room? Like, <laughs> if we're almost to the shore, is God going to put out his hand and pull us across if we were almost good enough? Or do we like get sucked down? Like... How, how much mercy is there um, for people who tried really hard? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? The, 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 at least one school of, of Christian thought says that um, the process of, of salvation is almost back to front from the way you're describing it in that um, you are first saved by um by being kind of um substituted so you your flaws and lack of divinity um are taken down into the underworld with Christ who was perfect and therefore didn't actually need like if if Christ was already divine he could have i guess made it across the lake to use your description there right he could he he was already capable of going across but he took down the he took the path downwards instead of us but then once you are saved the the living in a christ like way becomes inevitable so you so all the people you describe who are sort of turn up once on a sunday and then spend the rest of the leaf the the week living however they like actually aren't saved and and won't they will be punished after they die but those who have truly chosen the resurrected path they begin a process called sanctification which is becoming christ-like in your life so that so it's not that it's not that you will ever become perfect during your lifetime you won't achieve full christ-likeness but that the 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 mechanism for making it across the lake is that you um are considered equivalent to divinity right you you get christ's perfection and that's the so, so it's not do you see what i mean that it's the other way around you're not becoming christ-like during your life to make it across the lake but you're making it across the lake because you've accepted the switch do you, uh, have you come across this type of theology um, before this is kind of a part of christianity that i don't like and i don't think makes a ton of sense this idea that if you aren't good enough you get punished like most people just like they're not bad enough for hell and they're not good enough for heaven that's most people um i don't really feel like christianity adequately addresses that um christianity does not uh believe in reincarnation or any kind of transmigration of the soul or, um, you know, different kind of uh, levels of afterworlds or anything like that. So um, hmm. that to me is something that I, I really have like kind of a theological and philosophical problem with Christianity. Um, I, people are entitled to their own beliefs, but it's not sure. something that I... <sighs> 
it, it just it doesn't symbolically fit with what I, well, I, I understand I, 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 to be true about these things. Well, it sounds similar though to you were describing that most people can't make it across the lake. Like that, most people don't have that inner being, and uh, you know, like you were describing when you get rid of all aspects of a person, what's left, and most people, there's nothing there, and that's not sufficient. And I, th I think there's that similar sense with with Christianity, where whereby most people, like um, like Jesus, always talked about the the narrow way versus the broad way, and mm -hmm. it's the narrow way that leads to eternal life. So it's not that it's it's not that the the majority of people end up making it. It is only this the small the small amount. Um, it, yeah, it's it, it's hard, and um, you know, I I think so, condemning so not, people to like a, an eternal damnation for just not being good enough when maybe they were not even born with the capacity to be good enough. To me, that just I, I personally prefer the idea of karma where it's like, you know, it's it's not punishment. It's just kind of cause and effect. Like you do something, there's a consequence. Someone else does something, there's a consequence and it, maybe it affects you. And but, this but is just the, kind of part of the turning of the wheel of the cosmos. What's the consequence though for the souls that can't make it across the lake? Um. Well, it depends what tradition you ask, but in general, I would say... Uh, Probably the, the best way I like to describe it is, um, so the Vedas have this idea of the path of the sun and the path of the moon. And the path of the sun, of course, is the path of Christ. The path of the moon is what is also known as the path of the ancestors or the path of the dead. And this is where most people go. They become food for the gods. And then whatever's left of them gets chucked back into like this samsar churning of their totemic bio spirit. And those um, attributes are, there's no personality attached to them anymore, any individual soul attached to them, but they kind of just get returned back out into the wheel of generation. So it's kind of like, well, you know, maybe you have your great grandfather's nose, right? It's kind of like that, but you're not your great grandfather. You just like, there's parts of him in you, just as there's parts of all your other ancestors reshuffled within you. And it's this constant, just like reshuffling and returning of all these aggregates. Um, I noticed we're kind of coming up on the end of the thing. Did you still want me to talk about the, um, the journey of the sun, which I think is, um, kind of critical to understanding the whole oh, dying yeah. God theme. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, all, uh, all these dying God stories are of course, like trying to convey something true and eternal and the gods are all solar figures typically. And, Traditionally speaking, the sun is uh, considered to be that which through God's divine light shines into this world. So the sun is not God himself, it, but it's emblematic of something fundamental to the nature of God. You know, it's warm, it's life giving. And, um, and, and as everyone knows, the sun from its own perspective, if, if you're up in space, it, it's unchanging and ever bright. It, and it represents a state of being. But if you descend down into the sublunary sphere of Earth and you look at it from this vantage point down here in materiality, um, the sun appears very differently down here from our perspective in a state of becoming. And it appears to rise and set and to change position in the sky based on the seasons. So there's two ways we can break up the halves of the year to explain how this relates to symbolism. The first is along solstitial lines and the second along the equinoctial lines. And if you divide the year along the solstices from the winter solstice to the summer solstice, the sun is ascending in the sky from the Tropic of Capricorn um, up to the Tropic of Cancer. And then from the summer solstice to the winter solstice, it's descending down again. On the other hand, if you divide the year along the equinoxes, then from the spring equinox to the fall equinox, you have the half of the year where the light is dominant. And from fall to spring, you have the half of the year where dark is dominant. So at the winter solstice, we have the sun's light at its absolute minimum. It's the darkest day of the year. And it's around this time that Jesus and numerous other solar figures are said to have been born, right? So at the winter solstice, the sun hits the Tropic of Capricorn, and now it's beginning its long march upwards towards the pole star again. And the pole star is often emblematic of this divine ideal in some way. 
So we have a hope of new light coming into birth at this time of the winter solstice, but it's not mature yet. It's, um, it's still being suppressed by darkness, or if we want to think metaphorically, uh, by nescience. What happens at the spring equinox? Well, now we have equal amounts of light and dark on this day, but the light is starting to take over and it's gaining the upper hand. So zodiacally, this marks the start of Aries, and it's where Aries gets its quality of victory from. The light of the sun is now victorious. It's youthful. It's in its prime. A new spring has come, and of course, with it, hope for the whole world. And this quality of victory is like a divine victory. Um, the Persians actually had a specific word for it called fareno, and it was a word that referred in part to the sacred flame that never went out. Um, Oh, I can't think of the name for the flame, but I'm sure somebody will know what it's called. I think it still burns to this day, actually, even in Iran. Um, but it's an Olympian victory that it, it catapults one towards heaven. And so Easter, of course, is traditionally situated around the time of the spring equinox for this reason. Um, not because it's pagan, but because the resurrection of Jesus is emblematic of this solar divine nature. And so the journey of the sun is his journey, too, because the sun is emblematic of God and he himself is part of God. He's come down to earth to manifest that in the flesh, quite literally. And he embodies imminently this solar principle. And it's this principle that we all have to cultivate if we, too, want to make it into heaven. So when Jesus, you know, he's, he says he's the way, the truth and the life because he's the door through the sun rather than the door through the moon, which we talked about, the door of the dead. So this theme of uh, redemption vis-a-vis -vis the sun runs through all of the early mystery religions like a golden thread, suggesting that it's through the realization of our own inner divinity that we're saved. And in many traditions, only the sun god could traverse the underworld. Um, he, he was all, the sun god could, he was the only one that could get across those underworld rivers. And in others, um, the sun god could facilitate resurrection. Only the sun god could do that. So this story of death and resurrection is the story of the sun every year. And because this is pointing to a primordial, eternal, and divine truth, we see that truth reappear over and over in the context of different stories that all have the same message. And this is why, going back to the start of our conversation as to whether or not Jesus was a historical, literal person, it does not matter. His story could have been true, but his birth could have been, I don't know, they think he maybe he was born in actually in August or something. Who knows when he was actually crucified? I don't know. But the fact is, because he's a solar figure, we line his story up with these dates because it's emblematic of something about his essence. And it's telling us a fundamental truth that no matter who we are or where we are in the world, as long as we're even just observing nature, we can see this story play out. If you are some primitive living in the Amazon jungle and you have never heard of any religion, you still see the sun rise and set and change positions in the sky. And you I could theoretically still meditate on that and figure it out. Hmm. Is it the Atash Baram? Is that the flame, the eternally mm, burning flame? Might be. Maybe. There's, there's, uh, that, that's a, a flame that I found from Googling about Iranian flame still burning. Maybe it's a different thing. There right? might be more than one. Thank uh, you yeah, for maybe. looking it up. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing my best. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so, so this, the sun, there's this, as you mentioned, the, the golden thread, you look in, I, I guess this is comparative. Is, is, is this the process you, you find the elements of mythology that are shared in different traditions? Uh, and, uh, and by, by keeping what is common, and getting rid of the additional, you find the, the, the like the most important core ideas and, and, and harmonize them? No, what we want to do is strip away all of the trappings of religion and get down to the metaphysical core, which is beyond anything here in materiality. Everything we put on it here in materiality is just to help our puny little human minds understand the concept, because these are concepts that the more you try to put them in words, the further away you get from the truth of them, because they're things that cannot be explained or intellectually grasped at. They're things that must be experienced. Mm -hmm. And when you have that experiential knowing, then you understand it. And the mm -hmm. symbols are something that can kind of help us get there. Um, the stories can help us get there, too. They can certainly set us on that path. 
um, they can they can spark our our intention to explore it further, right? Um, mm. But the story in itself is not sufficient, and neither is the symbol in itself. Ultimately, it has to be lived internally to truly understand it. And this is why you have to become Christ-like inside. You have to pick up your cross. You have to go through the door of the sun with it. Mm. Is it possible to um, properly understand and embody these concepts in in a way that doesn't involve participating in an, in an existing sort of real religious practice that that already exists around you uh, it it strikes me that um it it's a, as you say it's a very different thing to um describe in words these religious practices versus a, a, a lot of well it's I, I i think it's a fairly universal thing around the world that religious practice is communal and centers on ritual and and is, is kind of embodied um mm. so so what's what's the best way for somebody who's um trying to reject the modern world and uh, and investigate spirituality to to go about um seeking authentic practice um, that's a question that I am still trying to answer for myself because I sure. personally, I, I haven't found any practice that I think really fits the bill for me. Um, in some ways I have felt that by committing to a particular practice, it is closing doors to my understanding because now I'm being limited by a dogma mm. and my approach so far, maybe eventually I find something that I want to settle into, but my approach so far is I want to learn from all religions, I want to find the common threads running through them and figure out what is the essence here? What is mm -hmm. the metaphysical truth that they're all pointing towards? If you get up above all of the dogma and all of the cultural and political stuff that gets heaped on top of it, if you stand up above and you just look, like what's, what is the pole star that these are all pointing to, right? Mm. And it's hard to do that in the modern world. It's hard to do it as an individual. Um, you know, in ancient times, if you had that kind of holy longing and you want to understand the esoteric stuff, you join a mystery school and they teach it to you their way and you become initiated. Um, would and would the mystery school have dogmatic beliefs? Um, in some cases for the lower ranks, yes. But the higher you get, the more they strip that away. The thing is, you have to prove that you're worthy of having that stripped away because many people cannot handle it. Just like they can't handle having their own materiality stripped away, they can't handle having the exoteric stripped off the esoteric. In that so sense, I'm, perhaps the same perhaps the same still applies today, that uh, it's necessary to engage with dogma to, to establish your, your kind of basic human connection to spirituality? For most people, I would say it is. And many people will never get beyond that stage. And that's okay. Like, it's still better for them to have that than to, to be an atheist. You don't want to end up like destiny, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're still better. Point. Like, you are still better <laughs> off for just going to church and rigidly believing some literalist interpretation of the Bible. Yeah, like, you will have a better life for having done that, if nothing else. Even if it doesn't get you to heaven, you at least still have something that's a compass for you. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. I think, I think, as I was saying at the beginning of the stream, it's going to be almost impossible to practice Christianity without that dogma of a sort of literalism on Christ and exclusivity. Um, for, I, I found the verses I was thinking of. Um, let me just quickly read them. So it says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, then we're found to be false witnesses about God, for we've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him, in fact, from the dead. And if the days dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. For only for this life we have hope in Christ. We, uh, If only for this life 
we have hope in Christ. We, of all people, must be most pitied. So there's this this really strong, like, yes. beating you over the head of, like... And if you read that in the context of Christ as in the Christ in you, if you mm. don't have Christ in you, then your faith is for nothing, right? It puts it, yeah. a different esoteric spin on to it. And the it's specific... still true on an exoteric level, too, which is the nice thing about these. Yeah, so it's it, the specific thing that he was responding to there, I guess, was... Um, people who were saying that resurrection doesn't happen for anybody um we, we, and and there's a particular view that's been pushed a kind of very materialistic version of christianity which which goes down the line that um hell is a um hell is an existence that you can have during your lifetime you know if you end up in a drug den somewhere then that that location is hell for you um, but but I think I think it's clear that we're not talking about allegory on that level, right? It, this is a um, like you mentioned about your soul. This is what happens after you die. This is talking of eternity and divinity, rather than just uh, a kind of self help. You know, your life will go better and you'll be rich and, and happy if you can only follow these like three or four simple rules. Well, I mean, there's the saying that uh, those who win in this world lose in the next and those who lose in this world win in the next. And I think applied huh. spiritually, it's like, you know, the more you suffer in this world, probably the more likely you can at least have a chance of winning in the next world, right? If you use that suffering right. to propel you towards spirituality and not um, despair. But mm. those who are happy in this world, comfortable, enjoying their time, they have no impetus to seek God. Uh. Why would they? Yeah, yeah. People only tend to see God when they're suffering, you know. It's the old. Um, it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of the needle for an, than for a rich man to get get to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. um, it it actually those an observation that I've made more recently is that okay, yes, to be materially w wealthy makes it very difficult to be. Um, spiritual and in that sense actually living in our super rich 21st century lifestyles is pretty awful and ma maybe we should give more serious consideration to actually going and living off in the wilderness and um, and suffering materially but actually those people who are so materially blessed are not happy during their lifetimes they're miserable they've got lots of hedonistic pleasures but they're they're not deep not, yeah, exactly. They're empty. They're not content. So in a sense, to follow the path of Christ, or, or as you mentioned, these, you know, to, to, to take the, the road towards divinity. Actually, this dovetails nicely with the stream with um, Columba, because he was talking about Catholic mysticism, which is defined as like, the practices for approaching God and, and has a lot of um, similarity to the sort of ascetic ascetic practices that you were describing um but th that path even though it doesn't le you know it's away from the the world of mansions and lamborghinis but you win you actually win in this life and in the next right you you don't only have um you don't only have a potential for eternal life but but you can find contentment in owning less and and living with fewer luxuries yeah, I mean, the, the only way I would push back on that is, um, you know, I'm I'm thinking of a client I had recently who um, had a lot of spiritual inclinations. He has his son in the second house, which is the house of material resources. And it's always interesting to me when I get somebody with a second house son who's got all these spiritual inclinations because it almost seems so at odds with that. The right. sun is, of course, pointing towards like your purpose in life, what you're oriented towards. It's your, it's kind of your compass. And oftentimes when I talk to these people, what I find is that their sense of needing resources and, and, and feeling this craving for income and stuff. And um, it's always often, I shouldn't say always, but often rooted in a feeling that they cannot practice spirituality unless they feel material materially supported. And I think there's some truth hmm. to that because it's hard to want to go sit in meditation and prayer when you're worried about your house being foreclosed on. 
and you're feeling mm, the pressure to go out and like say. just work your tail off, right? So to mm, some extent, you need mm. a little bit of material support in life in order to be able to pursue spirituality. And typically, I mean, often the priestly caste would have had a lot of material support so that they could just pursue these things and not have to do any kind of, you know, manual work of any kind. They, they're not the ones having to go out and learn a trade or fight in the wars. They're sitting in their temples, they're meditating, they're praying, they're doing their initiations and their rituals. Um, and at the time, I mean, that was considered so valuable for society that everybody was happy to support them in doing this because they were like the bulwark against chaos. Um, not so much the case now, though. <laughs> so now if you want to kind of be a lone urban monk, you still also need to have a job. <laughs> right. Yes. Notable that the um, Buddha was a, a, a super rich guy who who chose to become poor, but p perhaps a person who started poor wouldn't have had, you're saying it would have been much more difficult to find the capacity for sitting and meditating. Had he also yeah, and had I mean, to... many, many monks and priests and stuff rely on alms from people to support them. Um, but at the end of the day, everybody, we all have human bodies and we all have to eat. Hmm. And that means you've got to have some kind of material resource at your disposal. So hmm. there's, there is a point at which, you know, too much is a hindrance. But there's also a point at which too little is a hindrance. Hmm. Do you know the um, the parable of the sower? If you come across this one, the guy goes around scattering seeds. Some of it falls along the path and the birds come and eat it up. Some of it falls on rocky places where it doesn't have much soil. Um, and then it's like springs up quickly, but because there's no place for the roots to go, then it just like the sun comes up and it gets scorched. Some falls among thorns and it gets choked up. And then just like the last small amount falls on good soil. But then that produces a crop that's like hundreds of times more than what was sown. And then this is explained. Uh, it's one of the rare parables where we actually do know what it's about, which is saying that the message of the kingdom is told to all these different people. But there's the... The, there's those who hear the message about the kingdom but don't understand it um and then the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart that's like the so seeds on the path there's the seed falling on the rocky ground um which is those who hear the word and at once receive with joy but since they have no root they only last a short time um they just fall away the seed among the thorns is someone who hears the word but the worries of the life and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes it and makes it unfruitful and then the, the good soil obviously is the, the person who hears it and understands it and like loves it and I, I feel like that's really useful kind of conceptualization of how your circumstances you know can even though you hear the right message you, you know you come across these spiritual ideas and yet for various reasons it just doesn't take and that, you know, there's only that small amount left who can actually follow the path, but then they can pass it on to other people who pass it on to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, n not everybody is in a life that is karmically conducive to following a spiritual path. And that doesn't mean you can't find ways of bringing spirituality into your life. But, you know, some people, everybody's at a different place in their spiritual journey, right? And that's between them and God. Um, some people will take very meandering paths. Some people never get on the path. Some people are just on the straight and narrow right from birth. They were born into a family and they stayed that religion the whole time or whatever. But everybody's path is different. And I feel that if you're a sincere spiritual seeker, God will find a way to speak to you in a way that resonates with you. So you know, maybe the religion you grew up in, like traumatized you or something. And you, you just like, you could never go back to that. And everybody's like, oh, that's the only one true religion. It's like, well, God will find a way to still speak to you. Even, even though you can't hear it in the context of that religion, maybe you'll hear it in the context of a different religion, or you'll hear it in the context of a myth, or it speaks to you through music or something like that. Like if you're a sincere seeker, like God is not going to let you just wander off unsupervised you know it's like 
for people who who have that earnestness mm. eventually like you'll you're on the path that you're meant to be on at the time that you're meant to be on it and everybody kind of comes to god in their own different ways yes ask and the door will be open to you seek and you'll find all, all this kind of stuff yeah mm -hmm. Yes, like like true, genuine spiritual seeking is, is rewarded. Like having yeah. having given all of the pessimistic views that like there's not many people who make it. But if if you listening to this stream are genuine in your seeking, you can you you will make it if you if you truly pursue it, right? Um, I think so. And the thing is, there's just not that many genuine spiritual seekers. There are a lot of people who yeah. want God to come and take away their suffering or make their life easier yeah. in some way. But yeah. there's not a lot of people who just want to really genuinely know hmm. and 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 become Christ-like inside. There's not a lot of people who, because that takes effort, right? But if you are yeah. sincere, you'll you'll get there. You know, the you path... will reap the rewards of that. Like having said this was should be encouraging, but like the path inevitably will be full of suffering. Like the it will, you're, you're and, and and maybe even like things that seem like wrong turns too, but were necessary for your development in some way because you mm. can't see the full picture the way God does. Right? It could be something like um, you you just chance to come across a book that was like exactly what you needed to read at that time or just a chance encounter with somebody who just says something that plants a seed in your mind, right? Um, it's full of all these tiny little nuanced things that y you can't even really grasp the full meaning of until you kind of get to the end of the road and you look back on how they all built on each other. Well, thank you so much for joining me for Lambster. Um, I, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Is there any last comments that you wanted to make on the subject of resurrection or other projects you've got going on or, or anything like that? Um, I won't take too long, but uh, for anybody who's following the Revolt series, we should have a new episode out hopefully very soon. Like it's going to like yes. the video editing stage uh, <laughs> next week. So it's been like a year now. I apologize. Um, I've also finally launched my new website, astrologicat.com. For people who are interested in booking astrology readings with me, if that's something anybody's interested in, which I find most Christians aren't, but that's what I do. How, so, how, many, how many different pronunciations of Astrologicat have you heard so far? <laughs> Is it as bad as Philosophicat? <laughs> um. Well, you know, as I was saying to you before the stream, most pe it, as it's, it's taken like five years, but people now pronounce it Philosophicat most so of the time, and correctly. It, except for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm the one holdout. So how do you spell Astrologicat? A S T R O L I G Astrologi. I C A T. C A T. Basically yeah. like yeah, basically like Philosophicat, but astrology with an I at the end. It's good branding. I like it. And I'm very excited about the, the Revolt <laughs> series. I'm 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 really looking forward to that coming out. Yeah, and I've also got a set of live streams that I'm doing, trying to do weekly on the Bhagavad Gita as well, which I'm trying to do those Saturday nights. I just didn't do it yesterday because I was preparing for your stream, but should be back oh. next Saturday. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Well, I'm I ending. Know, I'm glad to do it. It's great fun. Great. Um, I've, I'm ending all of the streams in Lambster by reading a, an ongoing um, few verses going through the, the, the Easter story. Um, so I'm going to finish the stream with these verses. And even, uh, and when even was come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded it to be given up. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb which he had hewn out of out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary, sitting over against the sepulchre. <laughs>